Welcome to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, and life. Today's special guest is Rebecca Halpern. She is the director and writer of a fascinating documentary called Love Charlie about celebrity chef Charlie Trotter. And I'm also going to be sharing an excerpt from my latest book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking Diary Seasons. I'll be sharing an excerpt about my favorite part of Italy. It's the region of Abruzzo. So stay with me. And as promised, here's an excerpt from my latest book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking Diary Seasons. This is an excerpt titled Abruzzo, a quick eye to my favorite spots. And Abruzzo, as I mentioned, is one of my favorite regions in Italy. It's actually where most of my family comes from. I have just returned from my Pieta Terre in the mountains of Abruzzo, about an hour away from Rome. Still drunk, emotionally speaking, with all the food, wine, and beauty this little spot, well, not so little, has to offer. I know most get to travel only to the well-known places in Tuscany, Rome, or Venice. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're missing out on a true old world experience if you have not visited Abruzzo. It is considered the greenest region of Europe for its natural beauty mountains on one side, the Adriatic Sea on the other, and lush parks in between. It's a place where mountains coexist harmoniously with the sea. The beach stretches for some 80 miles with a sea cliff serving as a continuous backdrop. For years, famous writers have used the words, forte e gentile strong and gentle to describe this beautiful region some streets are still lined with cobblestone my favorite towns are taliacozzo avizzano pescata and l'aquila i'm in close proximity to them all and although each of these towns do have some sentimental value to me they also hold some great culinary experiences let's start with some delights in and around pescata in the united states san marzano tomatoes are considered king but if you're a food insider and truly abruzzese you know about the tomatoes from francavilla the town that's right near the biggest city in the region, Pescada. Even more delicious than San Marzano tomatoes, they're sold everywhere in Abruzzo in August. Year-round, everyone jars them for sugo or sauce. The pomodoro or tomatoes of Francavilla are deformed in shape, not perfectly round or oval, but they're a gourmet delight. A pound of these tomatoes with some olive oil, fresh basil, garlic, and onion makes a tasty sugo to top penne, pasta, or spaghetti. Near Pescata is Loreto Aprutino, my favorite little town to buy olive oil. It was once owned by the family of St. Thomas Aquinas. The drive up the hill to Loreto Apertino is a sight to behold. A landscape covered with olive trees and dotted with little churches, each of them covered with frescoes. Here you can find olive oil made with olives that are picked by hand, a taste like no other an old world treat. Then you'll need some wine. In the vicinity, you'll find the many vineyards and a superb Montepulciano d'Abruzzo to go with the pasta. Dessert is next with a trip to the locals' favorite gelato bar in Pescata. Although tourists opt for the glitzy or options, you'll find locals lining up outside the door at the local little coffee bars for their artisan gelato. If going to the beach makes you hungry, like it always does for me, that's no problem. There are plenty of ways, perhaps too many ways to satisfy your hunger. And of course, there's always the beach in Pescada. Here's a traditional recipe from Pescada. It's a dessert made with a type of sponge cake, almonds, and dark chocolate called parozzo. This is an Abruzzese specialty. It's a specialty from the region of Abruzzo. 
Paparozzo, and this serves four. That's P like Paul, A-R-O-Z-Z-O. One third cup of melted dark chocolate, and it should be at least 60% cocoa. A quarter cup of sugar, a tablespoon of butter, a tablespoon of almonds, a third a cup of flour, a third a cup of potato starch, 10 toasted almonds for decoration, and three eggs. Grind the almonds with one tablespoon of sugar, beat the egg yolks with the remaining sugar, add in the ground almonds, then flour, and then potato starch. Add in melted butter. Whip the egg whites until the peaks form and fold into a flour mix in the into the flour mixture place in a round cake pan and bake in the oven the oven should have been preheated to 350 degrees for bake it for about 40 minutes remove from the oven let cool take out of the pan cover with melted chocolate and decorate with 10 toasted almonds let the chocolate harden before eating if you'd like to visit Pescata, the easiest way is by train from Rome at Termini Station. There are also buses. The system in Abruzzo is called ARPA, A-R-P-A. If you want a true Italian adventure, take the A24 going north from Rome and then the A25 going east. Follow indications for Pescata. Next, we'll take a trip to the mountains, which makes me hungry as well. But there'll be plenty of culinary de delights along the way to take care of that. Ciao for now. Oh, hi, and my special guest today is Rebecca Halpern, and she is from this really neat documentary on the life of Charlie Trotter. She's the director and writer of Love Charlie, which is a documentary on the life and times of uh, legendary chef Charlie Trotter. Rebecca, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So I told, I had just told you, I'm not extremely familiar with him and I'm kind of ashamed because that's what I am also a chef as well. But uh, I figure I'm going to let you fill us in on, just tell us a little bit about Charlie for those also in my listening audience that are not familiar with him. You know, it's interesting that you should say that you're not familiar with him, even though you're a chef, because um, I think uh, one of the main reasons why we made this movie now is because Charlie's legacy stands to be lost to time. Uh -huh. He opened his restaurant in 1987 in Chicago and uh -huh. just exploded onto the scene. He put uh -huh. Chicago on the map for food uh -huh. and revolutionized fine dining in the United States. So wow. many of the things, so many of the things that we um, take for granted today, things mm -hmm. like the kitchen table, um, high-end vegetarian cuisine, um, you know, he was using quinoa before anybody even knew what quinoa was. Oh, wow. Um, he invented microgreens, which are now ubiquitous across the board from fast casual all the way to, you know, the finest dining establishments in the country. Yes, yes. Um, his cookbooks in many respects made him the godfather of food porn. Our Instagram feeds today uh -huh. would not look like they do, but for the photography that he used in his cookbooks, uh -huh. which no one had ever done before that. Uh -huh. His photography gets really up close and personal, which in the 90s was unheard of. Uh -huh. And they look more like coffee table books. Oh, wow. Do, like cookbooks, which up until yes. then had been more like, you know, how to guides for making recipes. It wasn't yes. this like deeper philosophical visual exploration of the composition and sort of the artfulness of the plate in the way that Charlie made it for wow. himself. Yes. Um, he was obsessed with ex exceptional ingredients and, uh -huh. and he had an exacting management style. Uh -huh. um, he insisted on doing two 10 course tasting menus every night. Mm -hmm. He changed the menus every night. Uh -huh. so that means that he was making 20 new dishes a day. Wow. And he ran his restaurant for 25 years. Oh my goodness. So whereas a, a regular, 
Uh, yeah. Whereas a regular chef might change the menu seasonally, you know, come up with a list of dishes that he keeps for a period of months. Charlie was changing it up every day, just like a jazz musician might change a composition of, uh, you know, a song that they play in concert or whatever. Wow. Is this in all of his restaurants? He would do that? Like, he well, um, certainly at his, at his namesake restaurant, um, he, like many chefs, he was among the first generation of celebrity chefs. So coming up in that class, you had Emeril Lagasse, you had right. Thomas Keller, you had Daniel Belude. Um, you know, a little bit later, you had Wiley Dufresne. And, um, but he was sort of among this first generation. And these were the guys who kind of pioneered that idea of chef as CEO, as well as the auteur that they were in their own restaurants, right? So yes. he started to branch out and Charlie did the same. He had several restaurants. He tried to, to have restaurants in Vegas twice. He had a restaurant in Cabo San Lucas. He had um, he had sauces and uh, smoked salmon that he licensed. He had a to-go place in uh -huh. Chicago for gourmet to-go food. I once took out for Thanksgiving from there because I used to live in Chicago. I'm from Chicago. Uh huh. Um, and there was like no end in sight. I mean, he wrote 14 cookbooks. I mean, the guy was prolific. Mm -hmm. And um, and yet, because I think he was more intellectual than say an Emerald was. Uh huh. You know, whereas Emerald's career sort of took off with the rise of the Food Network, right? Charlie's went, Charlie's went a different direction with the route of the cookbooks. Uh huh. Because of that, and because of the timing of the restaurant, which came along before social media, right? I, you know, I don't think people remember Charlie as much as they do Emerald or other right. chefs of his generation. I just wanted to ask you. So he wasn't right because Emerald was on you know, the Food Network, he was one of the first people, uh, chefs on Food Network. So Charlie, that's what I wanted to ask you. Was Charlie ever, I'm sure he might have done like a cameo or something on the Food Network. Did he ever do anything like that? Oh, sure. He showed up on the Food Network and later in the restaurant's life, he actually had his own PBS cooking show called oh, there you um, go. The Kitchen Sessions, uh -huh. um, which was on PBS. Um, you know, I don't know if it's that he didn't want to be on Food Network for some right. reason, or if he thought PBS was a better outlet for him and his right. audience. Um, but the shows themselves were really fascinating um, uh -huh. and a good glimpse into his pro his creative process. Wow. Yes, that's interesting. You know, I know the Food Network is uh, has a little bit more of a different feel than PBS. So maybe that's why you know, he didn't um, get to the Food Network and just stuck to, I think PBS gives you really a lot more of your own kind of, you can put your own style and creativity in it where Food Network is a little more commercial and you have to kind of have a little bit more of their guidelines. So it sounds like he would have been the type of chef that wants to, you know, use his own, uh, which I could understand. Well, Charlie, um, it's interesting. So the reason why his two restaurants in Vegas failed was because, uh, you know, uh, hoteliers want to turn the tables fast in Vegas and get uh, the gamblers yeah. out on the out on the out on the casino floor. Yes. And Charlie Trotter insisted on on sticking to his brand, which was a three hour, 10 course tasting menu. Yeah. So uh -huh. you start to understand the business behind why he failed failed there. Yes. Yes. Um, and then, you know, just in terms of the Food Network versus PBS and, you know, why Charlie didn't sort of scale up in the way Emerald did. Right. Charlie Trotter was an enigma. Mm -hmm. He was an extremely in intellectual person. He loved Ayn Rand uh -huh. and very um, esoteric uh, pieces of literature, film, uh, like uh -huh. he would stop his staff down in the middle of service to go watch Fitzcarraldo, which is an obscure film by Werner Herzog. It's a three hour movie. Uh -huh. and he would send them next door to watch it. And basically the movie's about this guy who's um, basically taking a barge through the Amazon and he, he gets a group of local indigenous people to help him 
foist the barge up over a mountain so that uh-huh. they don't have to go th- through this long journey. Anyway, yeah. it's all about pushing a, a boulder up a hill, right? More or yes, less. Yes, yes. And that's very much what chefs in a kitchen have to do together. They all have to be marching together in the same direction. Exactly. That was totally- um, and that lo- level of intellectualism, I think, is not something that um, is relatable in the way uh-huh. that Emeril and some of the other Food Network celebrity chefs are uh-huh. uh, masses. And so, wow. you know, that's why PBS was probably also a good outlet for him. But uh, yes. Yeah. So um, so he he has a series or had a series of cookbooks. So can you tell us um, again, unfortunately, since I'm not familiar with him, but now I, I want to make now you've really sparked my curiosity. I know I've heard his name. It's just that I don't know a whole lot about him. But, you know, I now I definitely do want to find out more. But can you tell us so what eventually, I guess, what happened or what was the demise? Sure. I'll, I'll give you the whole story in a nutshell. So, yes. um, Chef will Charles- this will spoil the documentary if we tell that or no? Well, it's his life story. So, um, I'll keep one, I'll keep one element to myself and then okay. you'll discover that in watching the film. But, um, the bottom line is um, Charlie Trotter was a self-taught chef. He uh-huh. never once really worked in any kitchen for more than a period of a couple months before uh-huh. he opened the restaurant when he was 27 years old right. um, in 1987. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he exploded onto the scene, put Chicago on the map for food, uh-huh. did two 10 course tasting menus every night. Uh-huh. And for 25 years, he worked relentlessly to have what was or would have been a three Michelin star restaurant. At that time, however, Michelin had not come to the United States yet. They didn't show up until in Chicago until 20, um, 2011. Uh-huh. And in 2011, um, basically, Charlie had the who's who of up and coming chefs come and work for him because he was running one of the best restaurants in America. I mean, the, his 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 flock of proteges is so impressive in terms it's the who's who of today's culinary world. And yes. I would say kind of chief among them is Grant Ackett's of uh-huh. Alinea. Um, and Grant Ackett's, you know, sort of helped to bring molecular gastronomy to the United States. And really, um, he won three Michelin stars um, every year that Eleni has been open, I think. I might mm-hmm. be misspeaking there. But anyway, so like just just inc- an incredible visionary talent. Grant and Charlie had a falling out. Um, Grant actually only ended up working for Charlie for two months. Um mm-hmm. He was obsessed with Charlie Trotter when he found one of Charlie's cookbooks in a bookstore and then, Uh you know, wrote Charlie Trotter a letter every day for I don't know how long to try to get the opportunity to work there. And when he finally did, being this young upstart who was obsessed with this chef, Charlie Trotter, he gets Mm -hmm. in the kitchen and the scales kind of fall from his eyes and he realizes that Charlie Trotter is not the guy that he imagined he would be. And he had a horrible experience at Trotter's and it's kind of gone down in Chicago food history lore as this mega beef for last lack of a better word. It was extremely competitive and Uh very, um, very, there was a lot of animosity there between the two of them uh, in Chicago. Right. Long story short, Charlie Trotter in year 23 of the restaurant, Michelin shows up. They give Grant Ackett's, who opened his restaurant, Alinea, literally a few blocks away from Charlie Trotter's. Uh-huh. They give him three Michelin stars, and Charlie only gets two. And the same year, the same thing happens. Uh-huh. And um, he decides to close the restaurant. And a year later, Chef Charlie Trotter died. Um, and so the film is an exploration of what happens when your identity becomes intrinsically you know, when your identity becomes intertwined in your work and what happens when the work goes away, it's very much a cautionary tale. You know, I like to say, if you play the same role for 25 years, Mm -hmm. um, do you become that person? And then what happens when the movie's over? Who are you? 
And so our film um, delves into, we go very deep into who Charlie Trotter was before he opened the restaurant. His uh-huh. name he went by Chuck. All of his uh-huh. friends and family knew him as Chuck. Uh-huh. And we got access to 350 postcards that he wrote to his first wife, Lisa, before they opened the restaurant together. Uh-huh. And in those postcards, you really start to see this young guy, a visionary who whose passion knew no bounds. I mean, he... He loved art and literature and music like Bob Dylan and he loved Stevie Wonder and he loved the talking heads. I mean, he was a cool dude, you know, Uh and he loved Apocalypse Now and, you know, all of these incredible films that he would write about. Um, Mm -hmm. And once he when he went to open the restaurant, his father bankrolled him to open the restaurant. They saw what a talent he prodigious talent he was. Right. Father bankrolled the restaurant. And when they were thinking about what to name the restaurant, they thought that Chuck Trotter sounded like a steakhouse. Uh huh. So the marketing people suggested Charlie Trotters. And in that moment, Chuck knew that he needed to become this chef, Charlie Trotter. He needed to assume this role in order to make his restaurant successful. And in doing so, he lost sight of his authentic self, which we argue in the film is Chuck. Right. And became consumed by Charlie Trotter. Trotter. Yes. It became a thing kind of. And wow. Yeah. So it's a kind of searing portrait of like what happens when you lose any and all balance in your life, when you really pursue something. And in Charlie's case, it was excellence. He was all about excellence. Uh Um, When you relentlessly pursue that day in and day out for that many years and the media portrays you a certain way and people think of you a certain way, whether they know you or not. Yes. Are you that person? Exactly. Who are, are you? And then you're losing your ide- your real identity. Um, oh wow. So tell us what so he ha- he had a lot of cookbooks, so people can certainly probably still find his cookbooks that they're out there. Oh, for sure. In fact, um, I'll just turn my ca- camera here, but I don't know yes. if you can see that tall yes. tower. Cookbooks. Oh well, that's all his cookbooks. Those are all his. Yeah. Wow. And they're and- still they're still lauded today as these groundbreak they're just as beautiful as uh-huh. any cookbooks that you see coming out today well wow. wow. he sounds like kind of like a D- leonardo da vinci of his time of the food industry in a sense you know i i think that's a very um apt comparison for sure uh-huh. yeah definitely so tell us so did the has the documentary just been released has it been out for a while so the documentary is going to be released November 18th in oh, nice. three days. Three days. Um, it's uh, It'll be available on Amazon and Apple on demand, as well as um, in select theaters over the next week or so, there'll be some screenings. So uh-huh. uh, I highly recommend seeing it in person in, in a theater, the theater. score, the visuals. You know, we started production on day one of the COVID lockdown. Oh, wow. And we were so lucky to have all of these archival materials because it enabled us to create this world, this kind of collage world Mm -hmm. of him through these materials. And so what you see in the movie, it's almost like he's inviting you over and opening a shoebox under his bed, you know, that has all these postcards and these newspaper clippings and all. It's like a museum exhibition. Exactly on film and yes. that world that texture you know this was 1987 when he opened the restaurant the 1980s and 90s were a different time you know people uh-huh. send you a text message today it's meaningless but when uh-huh. you had to write a postcard to someone uh-huh you had to go pick out that postcard and buy it in person you couldn't buy it online you had to go buy the stamps in person you had to sit down and write that postcard and then you had to go to the mailbox to mail it the amount of care and by extension love that he showed through his postcards uh-huh um, was a kind of connection that i think a lot of us are missing in this kind of like disposable world that we live in today you know we don't do that anymore and charlie when he opened the restaurant those uh-huh. two 10 course tasting menus 
Uh That's just another form of the postcards. That's how the postcards and the love and care that he poured into those to connect with others Uh sort of translated over to his work. Yeah. But eventually it obviously became corrupted. So is that where you got the title Love Charlie, I guess, from postcards, right? Writing? That's what it was. Yes. Well, from the writing. But, you know, the thing is, Charlie Trotter had a... um, he had a favorite quote that he often signed the inside of, of his cookbooks with it said, Uh after love, there's only cuisine. And, um, Oh, that's a great, my mom was a food writer in Chicago in the eighties and nineties. And Uh I started working on this. She sent me all of her, all of his cookbooks and inside his original, this is his first cookbook that I'm holding here. There's this inscription to her, to my mother, that uh-huh. says, after oh, wow. love, there's only cuisine. And I think what that means for Charlie is like, you know, it's a sad quote in a way. When you look at the, right. the arc of his life story, he couldn't have balance. He couldn't have lo- like real meaningful connection and love with people in his own personal life. All right. he had was cuisine in a way, but, um, but the care that he poured into his food and into these postcards was love. And right. so, you know, it was his idea of what love really was. And and actually that is for some people, I mean, the Italian culture, and I only know about that because that's what I am. A lot of people tend to tend to kind of express their love through giving food. So that's what it, really sounds like you know he did by all that extra care was really expressing love in some way but it sounds like a really incredible documentary so um tell it tell everybody again where they can find it so it's coming out november 18th so it's called love charlie the rise love charlie the rise and fall of chef charlie trotter it's going to be on apple and amazon for rent or purchase on november 18th Uh and it'll be in select theaters um throughout the next week or so i would recommend that anyone who's interested in seeing it in person that they log on to instagram or facebook to love charlie movie and um and they can get access to the information about screenings there Great. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be wonderful to see in a theater, in a live theater. So Rebecca, thank you so much and much success with this, uh, with this documentary. I'm going to definitely check it out. As soon. Maria, if you want to have another conversation after you've gotten to see it, um, yes. I'd be happy to jump oh, on. Oh, yes, I will you. let you know. Definitely. Because um, it's a complicated story, Maria. And I feel like once you see it, the conversation, you might feel like it's, you know, it's a little more more pointed. Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely. But I love that. I mean, I I love what you've told us already, because I think it's definitely um, a lot to to pique people's digest. Yes, (laughs) it's an incredible person. So thanks so much for being here, Rebecca. Thank you. And thank you, Maria. Watching and let you know. Have a great Thanksgiving holiday. We'll speak soon. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Maria Liberati Show. And thanks to my producer, Britton Roselle, and this week's special guest, Rebecca Halpern, director and writer of that wonderful documentary, Love Charlie. You just got to see it. If you're a foodie, even if you're not a foodie, it is a really very, very interesting documentary. Lots of other famous chefs and foodies on there too so you got to check it out and i also just would like to say thanks to everyone that came out to my book signings at the taste philadelphia and the lancaster taste festivals in october and november it was so nice meeting everyone and uh thanks for getting my book and thanks for coming to the book signing and those that did you got samples of some of the recipes for my book. You can find me on marialiberati.com. And by the way, the book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking, Diaries, Seasons, which is my latest book, you can find that on Amazon, 
on Kindle. And you can find any book for my book series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking, on Amazon and Kindle, and really anywhere you can find books. And of course, you can find them on marialiberati.com. And uh, you can also find info on the podcast at the marialiberatishow.com. And you can find me on Facebook at Chef Maria Liberati, on Instagram at Maria Liberati, on Twitter at Maria Liberati, on LinkedIn at M Liberati. And you can also find me on my Roku channel, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking by Maria Liberati. And on my Vimeo channel, the Maria Liberati channel, on YouTube, and on Pinterest at Maria Liberati also. And until next time, peace, love, and pasta.